when I first became a principal, I remember something that I was really intentional about. Who are the people that I would hire and how were their skills and gifts different than my own? I think that I was really passionate about was that I didn't hire a bunch of George clones for lack of a better term, but people that would complement the work that I do that would have different strengths that other people felt I would like to reach out to because maybe George just isn't my cup of tea. And that's okay. I had no problem with that. It was really important for me to actually have people that worked in the organization that maybe would see things in a different way than I did. We still had the same goals. We still wanted to do what's best for kids, really serve our staff, but they had different talents and gifts. And I think that's a really important aspect when we're looking at who are the people that we are surrounding ourselves with in schools. But another aspect of that, and I don't think I've really talked about this much, is putting those people in opportunities where they can lead in those different areas. It's one thing to actually hire people with different gifts, talents, and abilities, but it's another thing to actually put them in positions of leadership to not inherently just want to jump in and take over, especially in areas where you're not the expert. A thing that I'm really passionate about that leaders sometimes lead from the front, they lead from the side, or they lead from behind, that they have no problem with others taking the leadership reins in times of importance in areas that they are gifted in. That's part of surrounding yourself with actually people that have different abilities, different strengths that they bring to the table, is putting those people in areas of leadership. And that's why I really enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Kimberly Miles today. She talks a lot about, in her role as a principal, really being involved in learning of early literacy in her classroom, but also putting the people she serves in areas where they can lead the school. Because when you try to control what everyone else does, it's often because of insecurity, but it often leads to way more work. It leads to more doing things and the work's not better. When you actually build a team that has different gifts and you put them in those leadership positions, and I'm talking, when I say leadership, it's simply influencing people to move forward in a positive way. That can be from any position. That's when you find the greatest return on investment in the people, which is the most important investment you'll ever make in education. I really enjoyed this podcast with Dr. Kimberly Miles. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of takeaways for you. I hope you subscribe. Comment down below on something that you took away from this podcast. I know Dr. Miles would really appreciate it. So would I. But welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so blessed to actually have Dr. Kimberly Miles today joining me from Oregon. Go, go Ducks, right? Go Oregon Ducks, right? Where I know you said that you have a family member that went there. And so uh, Dr. Miles is actually a principal in the Oregon area. Uh, been in education since 1999. Uh, this is a second career. Uh, we've been talking back and forth, trying to do this podcast. I The first time we scheduled it, I lived in Canada. Now I moved to the U.S. So, uh, you know, I'm glad we got it while I'm still in this country. Who knows where I'm going to move next? So uh, I'm glad that we could finally make this time to, to connect with one another. And I know Dr. Miles has a, a, a passion for um, shared leadership, for early literacy. She works with a, in a K-5 school and, and has really talked highly, not only of the school, but of the staff too, and some of the incredible things that they're doing. So I'm looking forward to digging into that. But if you could just kind of introduce yourself Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today, and how you got there. That'd be a great place to start. Sure. Okay. So, Dr. Kimberly Miles, I started my career in um, Mooberry Elementary School. Isn't that a great name? It is. As a elementary school teacher. And uh, there I was given the opportunity to learn more about early literacy. So, I transitioned into a uh, reading coach, and then had the opportunity to go to the district level and be an instructional coach, supporting reading, writing, and math. And then uh, the opportunity, I also um, facilitated um, summer school for several years. Um, so it was sponsored by Nike, a local business. Oh, I'm sure right. more people have heard of that. And so I got the opportunity to do that for five years. And that's really where I had my passion to want to be, become a principal. And so I um, started um, my principalship in a small school and then transitioned up north into the Portland metro area. Um, I'm going to say at East Gresham Elementary School, I'm very proud of our school community. And um, 
so here I am, uh, elementary school principal. Just recently, um, we are working towards uh, improving students' uh, early literacy skills, K-5, and building momentum for growth and achievement. And we're really excited about that. Well, I'm curious because I know you said you transitioned from like instructional coach to, you know, um, the work that you're doing today as a principal. And one of the things that I think is really important, I know that when you work at, you know, school level leadership, and I'm talking specifically principals, district level leadership, superintendents, um, th there is some politics on in those jobs, right? In how you connect with community, you know, share the message out too. And sometimes I struggle when I see basically the focus is totally on that side, but not the instructional element of it. And sometimes I've seen administrators lose that focus. And it's like, if you, if you don't, and I'm not saying you have to be a teacher in that sense that you have to still teach. Cause I think a lot of times people say, well, principal should still teach. I'm like, well, it's a different role and it depends on the school and, you know, there, there's elements you, you, you have to be able to support your teachers. I think that's a really important aspect, but I do firmly believe you have to continuously dive into learning with your staff and that instructional coaching element. So how do, do you, do you find opportunities to, you know, embed some of that instructional coach experience into your 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 role as a principal do you see that that connection because i know you're focused on early, early literacy mm -hmm. and so obviously you you bring that that experience into your role as principal even though you're not technically an instructional coach but you you kind of are too right oh definitely so i'm going to go back to your first comment about all this other things that principals school communities are asked to do is there's a lot of noise out there let's just put it as noise. Yeah. And you can get lost in that noise if that's the path that you choose. But I consider my role as a principal, as an instructional leader, and that starts with our kids. So who are they and what do they need to know and what should they be able to do to grow and thrive and be and become this awesomeness that we know is locked inside that little little person. We get to do that every single day. That is just a gift, right? And so we start with silencing the noise, getting down to what it, who our kids are and what do they need to know and be able to do really well. And then we hold up that mirror and it starts with us, right? It starts with us. So mm -hmm. what are the purposeful actions that we as the adults in our community going to um, all agree upon due to collaboratively together to ensure that um, our students get to grow and thrive and be and become, right? And so that's where it starts. And I think an instructional leader or a principal starts by modeling learning. And so I'm not going to send the teachers to professional learning. We are going to go to it together. And we're going to determine, wow. looking at the kids, what is it that they need? And in our community, they needed to be readers. And so we dove really into professional um, opportunities to be learners ourselves first. And then so we could be learners, our instructors in our classrooms. And so really, it starts with the students. And then holding up that mirror, what do we need to do more of? And I think we ask teachers to do a lot. So mm -hmm. my job is to also really narrow the focus down. You know, again, you talked about political noise. There's also other noise for teachers. Mm -hmm. My role as a principal is to silence as much noise as I can to allow them to focus in on what's happening in their classroom and supporting them and whatever that looks like. And so, you know, that's, that's hard to narrow it down mm -hmm. and again, to go slow, to go fast but it's a priority and I think it's a, a right, a civil right of our kids to be able to read. And mm -hmm. so we start there. So we learn together, what does it mean to teach those early literacy skills to all of our students so that they um, can become readers, right? Because I know if I send my fifth grader to middle school without those skills, his right. their journey is so much harder, right? And so we, I like to, give the responsibility to the teachers, but that requires us to learn together on what that, what does that mean when I, you know, what do the teachers need to know and be able to do as well mm -hmm. in order to do that? And so we figure that out together. And so we're really um, prioritize collaboration and time together versus not teaching in isolation, but planning in collaboration. So our students get an equitable experience mm -hmm 
um, during their school day. And it's been a game changer. It is, um, you know, I don't have a lot of staff turnover. Um, we have 560 kids. We have 85 staff members. And I mean, sure, people come and go because they mm-hmm. want to they, they want to do something more or differently. And that's fine. Yeah. I totally support that. But empowering them with the understanding of, of um you know, those things, instructional skills and strategies that teachers need to have and implement regularly in a classroom is hard work. And it, it's always evolving because our kids are evolving, right? And so we have to not just do what we've always done, but do what our kids um, need. Right. And that takes learning on our part consistently. So last Friday, we were in um, professional learning. And, you know, I didn't send them to them to the, this professional learning experience, I went with them. So I could sit at the table with them and say, now what's this? Now tell me about that. Or, you know, or, or I could sit back and watch this back and forth banter between the teachers and, and understanding, starting with our student performance data um, first and then figuring out, okay, what components fits and building in their schedule, time for them to be together, to collaborate, not just in our, staff meetings, but throughout their work day, that's also a priority. So it's this, right. this dance, right? And that, you know, so there, there's a couple of things, it, you know, and I, I know you, you follow some of my stuff, you know, I'm a big sports guy. And so when you're talking about the distraction thing, I'm like, that's what great coaches do, right? There's mm-hmm. all the noise that's going on and what part of their job is to try to help block that out as much as possible. So people can focus on the task at hand and really, mm-hmm. and it's not ignoring it at all it's it's just making sure that and as you said narrowing that focus on like what are we actually trying to do to help our students to ensure that they're successful in a way that matters to them and you know that that core of literacy is really important uh, there's a there's an image years ago uh in from alberta education so i i typically was in alberta and i i'm gonna say this straight up because <laughs> like typically stuff that comes out from like the government is not really good <laughs> So, you know, we kind of have to like fix it half the time. But this one thing that came out, I'll tell you, it was one of my favorite things that ever I've ever seen come out from the government. And it was, um, I, I don't remember the outside of the circle, but basically what they had said was literacy and numeracy were essential to basically the building blocks of everything else. So they talked about like empowered citizen, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, all those elements those kind of big ideas that are so crucial to where we want to go. But they said, you know, I think what was really powerful was that it said, but this starts with, you know, making sure our kids, you know, are are literate or, you know, and not just literate, but fluent, right. Developing fluency in our students and also, you know, having basic numeric skills because sometimes when we, you know, and I've been guilty of this and I'm, and I think that that image actually really helped me, to say like, I talk a lot about innovation. I talk about some of those big ideas, but you still have to go back to build the, 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 those building blocks that you talk about with literacy. And I remember Dr. Yang Zhao, I've said, shared this quote a million times. He said something, it's always stuck with me. He said, reading and writing should be the floor, not the ceiling. And so that it's like this base that we, we find. So like when you develop this literacy in your students, it's not, it's not just that, but it's, it starts with that. Is that how you see it? And like, where do you go after you develop those skills? Like, do you see it that way? Or is there, is there something I'm missing there? I, it's, it's a jumping off point. Right. And so if they have that, that foundation, mm-hmm. then we can build from there and go anywhere. Right. And mm-hmm. so knowing our kids and where they're, who they are and what their mm-hmm. interests are, then we can support that. Right. And that's where the, you know, that's exciting. That's fun. But if I could, I want to go back to your sports analogy. Cause I really loved that. You know, you're the coach and there's this noise going on and your, your teachers are in it. And as a coach or a leader, you're, you're going in and you're, you're maybe you're participating in the professional learning or you're in the classroom or whatever you're wherever you're at what the magic happens is when you see these teachers in positions of strength right so maybe you're basketball and you're going to whatever positions they are but as a leader you you get to observe um, these teachers leading in capacities that it may not even be your strength 
And when I spoke of shared leadership, that's when you, that's a resource, right? And so you utilize that resource um, indirectly with their colleagues or other grade level teams or whoever it is. And that's where the richness comes in of, you know, now they, they're coaching each other, right? And now they're not just helping the kids in their classroom, but they're helping their grade level team or even the school community. And it's this dance of finding their the teacher's strengths how can they help us build capacity for understanding in our teaching and learning community and do it, working it all together, right? And so, yes, we, we use that um, in literacy as our foundation and numeracy too, but that's where the magic happens. When you find what they love, these teachers, what they love and they're good at and are skilled at and can be supportive of others, then you move momentum and mountains. And that, 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 so that, and I think that's a really important aspect that you talk about, like, uh, Chris Kennedy, he's a friend of mine, he's a superintendent in West Vancouver, and he talks about being elbows deep in learning with your staff and how important that is. And there's, there's one thing I'm going to talk about in a second, but you know, as you said, I think it's really important that when you spend that time, it's not just the content, the strategies that you're learning. It's about the people you're working with, because when you spend that time with them, um, you get to, you know, see them in different insights. I'm going to just share and I'll call it a tale of two superintendents. And, and when I'll say this, uh, one superintendent, let's just say the superintendent, you know, we talk about the importance of certain aspects of learning. And then that superintendent is actually partaking in the learning alongside the teachers, the principals, the support staff. And I'm going to be honest with you when you see that, it's kind of like, all right, we better, we better pay attention because our boss is here. Like, there's something there, right? And then the other superintendent maybe does the little spiel, gets you pumped up, and like, we need to be learners, you need to grow, and then walks out the door to go do other stuff because that's deemed as more important. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't seem as important to learn this because the person who's supposed to be leading it. And I think there's an accountability. There's an accountability for me it, when I worked in school divisions, when I saw the superintendent who I report to, or is maybe not my direct boss, but indirect boss, really kind of partaking that the same as the principal and saying like, that tells me how important it is to them that I got to get this done. But when they walk out of the room, I'm like, well, I'll, even if I'm here for, you know, in my head, 10% of the time, I'm still going to know more than they, cause they, they're, they're, they're out. They can be, they're here 0% of the time. And so do you find that there's more of an accountability to actually dive into that stuff when you are partaking in it? Or is that, you know, because I don't I, I honestly, I think there's less accountability. Maybe and maybe I'm just a troublemaker. When I saw my leaders leave, I'm like, I obviously don't care. So like, do you find that like helps move the, the vision forward? It, it, yes, it does. Accountability. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. But um, it also builds your capacity as a leader for understanding. And so you're able to ask the right questions, right? So the more knowledge you have, the better informed you are. You can ask those strategic questions when you go wherever you're going to see where teachers are at. And so, yes, it holds them accountable. But I also like to give them, um, I love Jimmy Casa's work on culturalized, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so... I always remember um, building that foundation of trust with my, with our staff. And so it's this fine balance of, you know, I, for instance, last Friday, I went to a professional learning, but I was only in one grade level team. Right. But I was still checking in with the other teams to see what, what, what they learned and what their takeaways were. So yes, I find that there's more accountability, but there's also a fine line where you're going to send them because you can't always go mm -hmm. and you're going to build, um, you're going to start building that trust is like, I know that you're going to go here and you're going to learn and I won't be there this time, but we're going to have really great conversations. And so maybe that's a little bit of the accountability that you're talking about. Right. It also um, empowers them that they, my principal trust me to go to learn and that I know that I'm going to be held accountable to share and implement whatever we've been asked to do. Right. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a balance, right? Yeah, I totally. I think I talked about this in interviewers mindset is that when you talk about leadership, sometimes that's being in the front, sometimes that's being on the side and sometimes that's being behind, right. Actually knowing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
when I looked at who I hired, I never tried to hire George clones. I didn't want to hire people like me. I wanted to hire people who complimented me and had strengths that I didn't have because I would need that. And then there's a really important aspect of this. If you hire people that have strengths that you don't have, then you better also be comfortable stepping aside when that, when those things, you know, come up and those things happen because sometimes you put those people in those positions to lead, but then when, you know, it gets down to it, you step in front of them, even though they have the expertise. Right. And you have to like, I think great leaders know when to like leave from the back. Right. And like, just be behind and say like, Hey, you're, you're the expert on this. You, you need to lead. And so when we were talking about this before, and this ties in beautifully to this, you were talking about the shared leadership framework something that you're really passionate about. So tell us, like, what, what do you mean when you say a shared leadership framework and how does that actually look like in your school? So can you, um, can you imagine what that feels like when you have the trust of your administrator that, you, that, that they know that they um, trust you to implement whatever it is that we've been asked to do? And so empowering teachers with understanding of, of whatever we're doing and then al- allowing them to lead there we're building the capacity for shared leadership, not just in one classroom, but in multiple classrooms. So I guess what what I'm really excited about and what what it really drives me is what can I do as a leader to empower teachers with what they need to know and be able to do. And I know I mentioned that before, but it's, it's really true. It's like, I'm not sure I'm answering your question right, but shared leadership really has provided us with a platform to build the capacity of understanding for teachers in, in independently and as teams in order to further the momentum of student learning. And so I always think about, you know, what does that feel for a teacher that my principal is um, entrusting me to um, do this thing and to do it well and to share my knowledge with other colleagues. I want to retain my teachers. I want to, I want to have them stay here for a long time. And so I can't do everything. And so I need to count on them to do these other things and giving them the um, permission to or empower to, to do that. I can only imagine what that feels like as a teacher to have that trust of your administrator. So I try to give that trust to them when I can and to build their, um, faith in themselves, um, faith in what they're doing and belief in what they're doing. You know, what we talk about that mind shift, that mind belief, you know, what I want them to experience that and feel that. And then the most important thing is when I see it, I celebrate it. Right. It's like, let's stop, let's stop just for a second. Did you see what you just did? Did you see the impact it had on the, your students in the classroom? It just happened yesterday. I watched a teacher in our newcomers program and she, it was an area of strength for her. And the feedback that I gave her, it's like, you taught me this, this, and this. Can you share that with your colleagues? I, I can't wait to hear what that conversation was about because this was an area of strength that I saw in you. And our kids were, were blossoming under that instruction. And that's just a small example of, of what one leader can do is to recognize mm-hmm. it, to celebrate it, and to, to, to build that capacity for understanding and, and sharing the the load well and that and i think the sharing load is actually like a, a great way to put this because um i've worked with leaders teachers and maybe i use the term leaders loosely maybe i should say administrators who were very overbearing um and micromanagey uh, i don't know if that's a word <laughs> micromanagey but it, but it's kind of it's interesting because i feel that when you micromanage you're more stressed and you actually work harder like you actually and maybe it's not work harder for sure work dumber if that maybe that's i don't know i know people talk work smarter but there's work dumber too Mm -hmm. and so when you actually try to do everything because you don't necessarily trust the people that you hired which is a terrible way to be um it actually causes more stress and it's not a good strategy and i i was always of the mindset and this is actually the same with students um, I was always of the mindset, I'm giving you trust without you earning it. I don't need you to earn my trust, I, but you, you can lose it at some point, right? Like, you know, there, there is that, you know, because I think if you kind of go with that mentality and you, you have really high expectations for people to lead, to do incredible things, more often than not, they live up to it. But if you're like making them jump hoops to prove themselves to you, they get sick of it. And then they start to resent you, right? Like, hey, you hired me. Just trust me to do my job. Like, you know, it's not even it's not even trust me to lead. It's just trust me to do my job. 
right? Like the bare minimum. And then people get really frustrated with that. And so I'm sure, I'm sure you've uh, like, can I say I've never been burnt by that? hundred percent, but I'd rather be burnt by, by, you know, one or two people than let down hundreds or thousands even, right. You know, throughout the career that I've had talking about how, you know, you, you give that trust and people can lose it through that process, but they're more likely to live up to higher expectations. Um, what, the one thing that you said, and it really resonated with me, if you compliment me on stuff that I'm, I know that maybe this is like a George therapy session, all of a sudden, if you compliment me on things that I'm doing well, it will actually push me to do even better at those things. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and I, you know what, George, I get it so often. Yeah. I get more, I get more and because they're blossoming, right? And it's just, it's exciting. But I also want to say that I also have very high expectations and I make those clear. And, you know, so with those expectations, I ask them to do whatever it is that they're doing to, with instruction and implementation. But when they rise, they rise further. And it's so incredible to watch. Okay, I got, I got, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to stump you here. I'm gonna see, I got a little trick question for you. I'm gonna, because, okay. you know, I, you and I talked about some of the great leaders you worked with on the other podcast, and I really appreciated what you shared there. Uh, I want you, is there anything you would say that you as a principal, and maybe I'm not trying to stump you, but I, I was just kind of thinking about this as I was listening to you. Is there anything that you would say that you do that? you never necessarily experienced as a teacher, but maybe wanted as a teacher when you're, you know, is there something you do as a principal that you're like, you know what, I wish my principal would do this. And then you're like, okay, I'm principal. So now I'm going to do this. Is there anything that you try to do that maybe you didn't get when you were a teacher? And I'm not saying, I think every leader has their own gifts and abilities. I'm not saying anyone that you ever worked with was bad or anything like that. But I think a lot of times I try to think about what did I want as a teacher and how am I trying to be that as a principal, not trying to replicate what my previous principals did. Right. So I'm not sure I'm going to answer this right, but I'm going to try. Well, is that I was hard to get the question out. So I, I wish what I love now, and I'm not always sure that I did then, mm -hmm. was to make the connections with kids as to get to know who they are. And, you know, so one of the things I do every day is I greet 560 kids at the door. That's and the it is, you're right. It's better than the best. It mm -hmm. brings, I'm still beaming. It makes me smile every time that they know that I'm going to be there every day. And now I don't know all their names yet, but I'm right. working on it. Um, but I wish I would have been that teacher who was at the door, you know, checking in and doing the hellos when I way back when, but I make sure that I do that now. That's a priority for me. Every okay. Day. So this is, this is actually, okay. Now I'm going to talk as a dad. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sometimes my daughter will have friends over and one of the questions I'll say, how do you like your teacher? They always love your teacher. Like, so, like it's always they love your teacher. And then I'll ask this question. What's your principal's name? And it is important that, it's important that they they can tell me. And if they have mm -hmm. if they're like, I don't know. That I'm like, really? You don't know who your principal is? Right. And and like I think you're the kids are more likely to know the principal if the principal is actively trying to get to know all the kids. And as you know, with five hundred and some kids, it's gonna be really hard to do. But obviously they see you, they know who you are, they might not actually, you know. Like we were talking, maybe you're doctor principal to some kids, but, but that, you know, whatever, I think that that is really important to me. And a lot of times, and I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this. A lot of times it wasn't about me getting to know the kids, why I would do that same thing. Cause I used to do that every morning. I would say goodbye to them at, at they go on the buses. It was like a selfish thing. Like these kids give me so much energy. And it's such a good thing, right? Like, it, like it was never, it was not just about them. It was about, you know, this is why I'm here. I'm here to work with these kids. You've ever like, sometimes I'm having a bad day. I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to go into classrooms and see kids because they just give me energy. Right. They do every time. That's awesome. I uh, also manage our social media um, accounts and um, I always have my phone with me. And 
what ma uh, what makes me smile is little kids will when I go in there and I'll, I'll take I mean most of the postings up there from you know things I've caught and teachers send them to me too but I love it when I go into the classroom and they smile at me like they're posing because they I know I'm going to get their, their, their <laughs> I love it I love that well, <laughs> so please, it's like oh my gosh <laughs> I love that Dr. Miles it's been awesome to talk to you today um no. you know as a dad I think there's two things I look for in teachers and uh, especially administrators, you have a vision of where you want the school to go and it's clear and compelling, but that you also build the relationships. And you've obviously shown that um, in, in the great work that you do and the pride that you speak, not only of your, your students, but of your staff too, which, you know, tells me a lot uh, about not only you as a leader, but your school, which is absolutely incredible. So um, everyone, I really highly encourage you to connect with Dr. Marles. You can see her information down below, but thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know there's a million things you could be doing today and you spend a little time with me. So I appreciate it. Thanks so much, George. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a wonderful day.